We've been partway through a series here at 412 called The Most Important Things. And we've been diving into relationships and all the, the people that God has put around us and how to navigate those things in a way that is biblical and that is Christian and that is for our own benefit and our own good. And we talked about family last time and we saw kind of an overview of uh, parents and children and siblings and what God calls us to in the midst of those things. For the next two weeks, starting tonight and next week, we're going to be talking about marriage and sexuality. And we have tons to cover, uh, and so we're going to get right to it tonight. If you're a note taker, then uh, tonight and next week would be great nights to take notes as we're going to be flying through a lot of stuff, and we'll try to put it on screen for you. But the first question that you may have is, why talk about marriage with teenagers? Why talk about marriage with teenagers? And I have two reasons that I think this is really important and valuable, even though uh, none of us uh, in high school uh, generally are engaged or getting married. But here's the reality. Most of us will one day be married. And if we wait until we're married to try to see and understand what God says it is and his design, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. And so because marriage is in the future for many of us, it is so valuable to slow down and to take some time to see what God says about it. And the second reason I think it's so valuable to talk about marriage to teenagers is because you can't really talk about biblical sexuality without also talking about biblical marriage. That they're intertwined, and we're going to see this over the next couple weeks, and sexuality is something that is so important and so prevalent in our culture that it's worth addressing and talking about what God thinks about this since we are just inundated with so many other thoughts and ideas in our culture. And yet to do that, we have to build the foundation of marriage, and we're going to see why by the end of tonight. So uh, if you have Bibles, you can follow along. We'll put the verses on screen, but I'm just going to pray for us tonight, and we'll jump right in. Father God, we love you. And Lord, as we dive into what may be hard, what may be confusing, what may be countercultural. God, I pray that you would elevate your word, God, and it wouldn't just be um, among all the opinions and ideas and thoughts that we hear, but God, I pray that your word would be elevated, that it would have authority tonight as the words of God and what you say for our lives, for our good, and for the good of those around us. God, that's a supernatural thing. I can't force that. We can't choose to make that happen. So God, I just pray that you would use your word powerfully in our lives tonight. Your name, amen. So there's a lot to cover, so we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. But the first thing I want to do was just start with a couple kind of opening statements. Um, I've been reading a lot of lawyer books lately, so they do opening statements. But these are just kind of some some ground rules, some points here uh, that will help us as we talk about marriage tonight and sexuality primarily next week. And the first is that marriage is created and defined by God. In Genesis chapter 2, we see verses 22 through 25, it says, And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Make a little mental note there. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So Genesis chapter 2 takes place kind of at the end of the creation of the world, where God has created everything in six days, and God makes a man, and then he makes a woman, and then he institutes the very first wedding ceremony. If you dive into kind of the Hebrew here, you see that there's all sorts of parallels to what they would consider a wedding ceremony. And I think it's really cool when it says that God brought Eve to the man. It wasn't just like, here, man, here's a possession for you. That's not how the Bible talks about women and marriage. What God is doing is essentially walking Eve down the aisle and giving her away at her wedding. Then how cool is that, that God walked Eve down the aisle? God creates marriage. He didn't just make a man and woman and and say, here, you can be friends forever, or here, you can be uh, buddies or whatever. But it says, the man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. God creates marriage. It's his idea. It's his creation. Therefore, and this is what matters for us really tonight, he gets to define what marriage is because he created it. 
If you're an inventor and you create something and you patent it, right, you get naming rights to that thing. We don't get to take a fish and say this fish is actually a house because we didn't create those things. That would be ridiculous. We don't get to take marriage and say, nah, I, your idea is okay, God, but I'm actually going to define marriage how I want to define marriage. So as we talk tonight, we're going to see this marriage and what God puts out there as biblical is God's definition because he created it and marriage is his. And he has given it to people and yet it is his creation and his definition. Tonight is not my opinions. It's not Church of the Gates opinions. We are basing this off of what God has told us in his word. The second kind of opening statement is that marriage is a good thing, but not the ultimate thing. Proverbs 18, 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Marriage is a good gift from God that he created and he has given to people. So dudes, finding a godly woman is a good gift. God says that's like finding his favor. Ladies, finding a godly man is a good gift, and it brings the favor of God. But nowhere in the Bible does it say that marriage is the gift. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it is the ultimate goal of being a Christian. I went to a Bible college, and Bible colleges are famous for marriage jokes because it's a weird Christian click circle thing, and um, you know, they would, they used to tell the ladies, the college wouldn't, but students would tell the girls like ring by spring or you get your money back. Uh, and that, you know, would play out. A lot of people would be engaged in the springtime, but the reality is a married Christian is not a varsity level Christian, just like a single Christian an unmarried Christian is not a JV Christian. You see, all of us start life unmarried. We all start life single, so we have that in common more than we do marriage. It doesn't make someone less of a person, less valued by God, or less useful if they're not married. And not all churches and and places know how to embrace unmarried people, which is sad. And it really causes the church to miss out on what those who aren't married have to offer. And I know there are many people who aren't married that feel like this weird Christian pressure and and Christian circles can be weird and there can be a ton of pressure to get married. It's like if you're not married, something's wrong with you or if you would just, you know, mature a little bit more in your faith, you're just not ready to be married. That's why it hasn't happened. And um, I think we can all look around and see that you don't have to be ready to be married. There's plenty of people who get married that aren't ready to be. So it's not like God is, is waiting for us to mature. People used to say to me, I was unmarried and a pastor, and they'd come up to me and, and they'd be like, I'm going to pray that you find a wife. And like, that's a good thing. And I'm grateful for those prayers and they're answered in Katie. But at the time, I also remember thinking like, that's okay. But there's also a lot of other things going on in my life that I would like prayer for um, that are outside of this. And so I've, I've walked some of that singleness in Christian circles. And, and here's the reality. Not everyone will marry. And that's okay. Not everyone gets married, and that's okay. You might feel looked down on by others, but in God's eyes, you are just as valuable, useful, and important if you are unmarried and a Christian as if you were married and a Christian. I think it's important for us to remember that Jesus wasn't married, and he lived a full human life. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, wasn't married, and he lived a full Christian life, was used by God in unbelievable ways. So if you're ever in a setting or a position where there's kind of this looking down on those who aren't married as, as less than or not living God's full purpose for their life, then, man, I would just encourage you to flee from that. That is not a godly understanding of marriage. So the foundation set. So now let's dive into biblical marriage, which is a good thing, but not the ultimate thing. Biblical marriage. Here's what the Bible would define as biblical marriage. One man and one woman... Under the lordship of Jesus, faithfully for life. So when the Bible talks about marriage, this is what it's referring to. And we have to be really clear on the biblical definition of marriage, or else we're going to get all sorts of mixed up and confused. And we're going to walk through this definition piece by piece. But people will call other things marriage uh, that are, are legally a marriage, but aren't biblically a marriage. Okay, so I want us to understand that legal doesn't always mean right. Just like illegal doesn't always mean wrong. Well, that's more of a gray area, right? But in some places, it's illegal to be a Christian. That doesn't make it wrong. 
Uh, Oregon just legalized small amounts of cocaine. So I think we can all look at that and go, okay, just because it's legal doesn't make it right, okay, wise, or good. So just because something is legally a marriage doesn't mean it's biblically a marriage. So the first thing in this definition is that biblical marriage is between one man and one woman. Genesis 2.24 says, A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You see very clearly here, God in the first marriage brings a man and a woman together, and only a man and a woman together in unison, they become one flesh. Nowhere in the Bible does it refer to marriage as anything other than one man and one woman. Certainly in the Bible you see stories of of polygamy and many other things, but nowhere in the Bible do you see God picture or command or call us to anything other than one man and one woman. And this isn't popular in our culture, and so I'm just going to challenge you right now, don't check out because maybe I've said something that you disagree with or that wouldn't be popular at your school. Because again, I'm not here giving my opinions, but we want to see what God says. And before we reject it, we want to make sure we understand what he says. And so if you kind of have all of a sudden kind of a hardened exterior of, of, man, that's not how I understand marriage. That's not what our world says. Stick with me through the rest of tonight. And we're not answering the question. I want to be clear on this. We're not answering the question uh, of who God loves. The question is, what is biblical marriage? We're not sitting here saying, well, this is a study of who God loves or who Christians should hate or who should be treated equally. The Bible talks about all of that stuff. The Bible talks about people being treated fairly, justly, and lovingly. The Bible talks about um, God loving everyone. The, The Bible talks about Christians reaching out to those far from Christ and who don't live in his design. All those things are still true. And so as we talk about this tonight, just because God defines marriage one way, doesn't mean that this is also a study of that must mean God hates everybody else or that must mean as Christians that we isolate and reject people who see things differently because that's not the call of a Christian. But when we say biblical marriage, we have to be very clear, it's between one man and one woman. And here's kind of what's humorous to me in this. Now, in 2020, this is a radical idea um, in large part due to the LGBTQ community, right? That they would define marriage differently and that really would separate us in in our understanding of marriage from them. But back when the Bible was written, this was also a radical idea, but less so because of LGBTQ and much more because of polygamy. The idea of having multiple wives was rampant in their culture. And so it's funny to me that biblical marriage has always been a radical idea that doesn't fit in culture. That's not new. Today, the controversy focuses on, wait, just a man and a woman? That's the only people that can get married. But back then, the controversy was, wait a second, I only get one of these? You're telling me it's one wife? My buddy over there has 250, right? And so the controversy has always been there, but the focus of it has changed. Two, uh, the second part of the definition, biblical marriage is meant to be under the lordship of Jesus. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus is supposed to be the example of of how spouses love one another, which means both the man and the woman are supposed to be under the lordship of Jesus, who's the true head kind of unifier of the marriage. Jesus, it says, is the head of his people, and marriage is a gift underneath that. And marriage functions best when both the husband and the wife are pursuing Jesus. We know that there are situations that land outside of this, but the Bible calls husbands, so guys, this is you one day, to lead your family, your wife, spiritually. That is primarily your responsibility to lead in that. But let me say this. We lead the way Jesus leads his people, which is not harsh or with an abuse of authority or with force or coercion or violence or harshness that we lead graciously and gently and patiently and humbly. But the Bible calls both the husband and the wife to pursue God first and foremost above one another. So I want you guys to hear this. The absolute best thing that you can do for your future husband or your future wife is to love Jesus more than you love them. I want you to hear that. If you take one thing away from tonight, the best thing you can do for your future husband or your future wife is to love Jesus more than you love them. 
The third thing in this definition is that biblical marriage is meant to be faithful. Hebrews 13.4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Marriage is meant to be an exclusive relationship. It's meant to be holy. That means set apart and special. Biblical marriage is, is a marriage that is faithful. And I think the easiest part of this to understand is the physical faithfulness part, which is, right, don't commit adultery. And we're not supposed to uh, be with or sleep with someone other than our spouse. And adultery is a huge part of our, our culture. And a marriage where either the husband or the wife is unfaithful physically is not a biblical marriage. Years ago, there was a website that was designed for husbands and wives to find people to cheat on their spouses with. So this was obviously a a very corrupt, very evil website. And hackers broke into this website and released the names of everybody who had made an account on this particular website. And it was just public, you know, publicly sent out there for people to view and to see. And on this list, people were checking and people found uh, spouses' names on this list. People found um, well-known pastors' names on this list who had created an account in this uh, adulterous website. And man, that is, that is sad and that is evil. And the Bible says that defiles the marriage bed. That, that is uh, ruining something that is holy and unique and special and set apart. And God has a stern warning. It says that God will judge those who do this. I mean, I don't want to soften that punch any. There are plenty of times that we say God is judging something and, and maybe, you know, we've, we're coming across harshly or we're saying that wrong. But man, this is something that God clearly says, I myself will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterer. But there's another aspect to this idea of faithfulness. It's not enough to just say, well, I didn't actually cheat on you. Our world has a lot of messed up definitions of what is actually cheating, um, and, and it's, it's really not helpful. But the marriage being held in honor, it says the marriage bed must be held in honor, means a few things. It means that your marriage is one day, that marriages are called to be emotionally set apart, that the emotional depth and connection you have with your spouse is reserved for them. It's meant to be physically set apart, that the things you do physically together beyond just sex right, are, are special and unique to the marriage. When you're a husband, you are saying no to intimate or unique relationships with other women, even certain types of friendships. When you're a wife, you are saying no to intimate uh, or, or unique relationships with another man, even certain types of friendships. This is why for us now in high school, for you now in high school, it is so important to establish healthy relationships with, with guys and with girls. Uh, when I was unmarried, I had some friends who were girls, not a lot. Um, I had some friends who, who were, were women, and that was fine. But now that I'm married, we still have friends who are ladies, who are women. But those friends are friends that my wife and I have. That I don't have just friends who are girls apart from my wife. I don't have friends that I go hang out with who are women. Uh, It's different because we have a unique and special relationship in marriage. I'm not going to just go hang out with other women without my wife, even if we're we're mutual friends, right? We must honor the marriage. And, And, man, we know this. And even though there's, like, all sorts of ways that our modern culture makes fun of this thinking and is like, this is terrible and toxic... And we know this. I mean, if you're dating somebody in high school, imagine you're dating somebody and they start hanging out with like another guy all the time, one-on-one. Like, you probably wouldn't just be okay with that. Even if you were okay with that, inside you'd probably be insecure. You'd probably be frustrated. You'd probably be hurt. Even if they're like, well, I'm not cheating on you. Right? This idea of faithfulness is far beyond just a single act of cheating. It is, it is keeping your marriage relationship wholly and unique emotionally, spiritually, physically, that it is set apart for something different. Fourth in this definition is that our biblical marriage is meant to be for life. 1 Corinthians 7.39 says, A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Now, this verse uh, starts off by talking about women, but it certainly applies to men. 
and to women. Marriage is a covenant, which is kind of like a a stronger promise in some senses. It's a covenant for life. There's no marriage in heaven. God, as Jesus, is very clear that in heaven there's no marriages and, and these relationships end. So death ends the covenant of biblical marriage. Death ends the covenant of biblical marriage. But marriage, the way God created it and designed it to work, is for life. Divorce is so rampant in our culture that it seems normal. I've seen all sorts of statistics uh, about percentages and, and numbers. And, um, and our world just sees marriage differently. I had someone I worked with years ago who had a great quote about marriage. And by great, I mean sad, but it made me chuckle. He said, I'm not really into marriage because to me, it's basically betting you half my stuff that I'll love you forever. <laughs> and like that is how the world sees marriage. That why would I risk losing something in a divorce when I don't have to commit that, and I don't know if I'm going to love you forever. Um, And my counter to me would be, man, why would I ever want to be in a relationship with somebody that says, yeah, I don't know if I'll love you forever. Um, But he was was honest, and I so appreciated that. And so when we talk about marriage for life, God designed it to be for our lives. And I know many of us uh, have experienced divorce in our homes, divorced parents, maybe step-parents, and um, God created marriage to last a lifetime, and there's, there's plenty and plenty of reasons for this. Marriage is supposed to be unique. It's not supposed to be something you can just opt out of if you're unhappy. You're not supposed to just say, this marriage was okay for a while, but I'm just going to leave now. As we've talked about, this unique, holy, special relationships that set apart. Now, there are very specific circumstances where divorce is biblically, uh, God says that it's okay. Um, in the case of a non-Christian spouse leaving a Christian spouse, in situations of, of abuse and harm, and possibly some situations of unfaithfulness, and, and there's some thoughts on, on some of that. And so there are very drastic, very sad, very broken situations where divorce is okay, and divorce is allowed by God. But most of the reasons that we get divorced today are not these things. Most of the reasons people get divorced is because they're unhappy because their spouse is not fulfilling them the way they thought they were going to, or they weren't able to change their spouse like they thought they would, or they claim their spouse has changed and is different than the person that they married, or they like someone else, or, or it's just not fulfilling to me anymore, or whatever. And biblical, biblically speaking, marriage is supposed to be in effect as long as we live. That verse says that husbands and wives are bound to each other. They are connected. They are covenanted together as long as they live. Man, biblically speaking, God has a lot to say about remarriage as well, which is a really difficult subject and a really touchy subject. But remarriage is really only meant to occur in the case of a death. Like that verse said, the wife is free to marry whom she wishes or possibly in the case of what we just talked about as a biblical divorce. But just because we get divorced legally, again, legal doesn't mean right. Just because people get divorced legally, right? Sometimes we'll talk about like, well, we're married in God's eyes. Well, if you get divorced legally, and it's not for one of these biblical reasons, then God does consider you still married. And so to remarry someone else would break the faithfulness part of marriage as it would, the Bible says it would cause you or you would cause someone to commit adultery. I mean, this is a hard truth, but here's why this is so important. If we go into marriage thinking, this doesn't work, I'll just get divorced. It's not that big of a risk. I'll just opt out, or I can always remarry. It's no big deal. Uh, God wants me to be happy. Of course, he'd let me remarry. This is not biblical thinking, and I, I shouldn't even phrase it that way. It's not so much, will God let you or not let you? He's called us to this marriage that is unique and set apart from our world. And when we break that, we're going to harm ourselves and to harm those around us. And so when we talk about this, marriage is meant to be for a lifetime. And that includes divorce and remarriage. Marriage is not one of those things that is meant to happen over and over in our lives. And yet we know that this brokenness, this imperfection has touched many of us in our lives. And I'll also say this, that just because someone has made a wrong decision and has sinned does not mean they're outside of God's love, outside of God's forgiveness, or outside of God's redemption. You see, we live in a world that is imperfect, and many of us have families or or ourselves who have experienced this and have experienced less than God's design for marriage. 
And I just want to remind us that this is not a definition of who God loves. God is not saying that I love everybody who's faithfully married and anybody who's broken that I don't love anymore. This is a definition of marriage and and how God created it and designed it to be. God did not create marriage to happen multiple times in our lives. And sometimes Christians, we get a bad reputation uh, for disagreeing with the LGBTQ community. And and some of that's earned as there have been Christians over the years who have disagreed in a way that is um, not just disagreeing, but has been like harsh or condemning or hurtful. And the reality, though, is that we should disagree with any type of deviation from God's plan for marriage. As Christians, we should say, man, we are so against divorce in 90% of cases. We are so against remarriage after unbiblical divorce, not because we don't care about people or we don't want them to experience a full life, but because we care about what God says is right and good and honoring to him and healthy for us. And so whereas Christians sometimes get reputations for being against certain things, sometimes that gets misproportioned and misbalanced. Or man, we should see divorce as outside of God's plan for marriage. And as Christians, we shouldn't just be okay with that. It doesn't mean that we're harsh or judgmental or unloving, but it means we say we care about what God has said is good and right and the holiness and the uniqueness of marriage. The last kind of point for tonight is that marriage is about the gospel. Marriage is about the gospel. Ephesians 5.32, this is the Apostle Paul writing, and he writes a whole chapter on marriage. You can read Ephesians 5, and at the end of it, he says this. All that he said about marriage, he says, this mystery, meaning marriage, and, and what he's about to say, is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church, Jesus and his people. Marriage is meant to show the love that Jesus has for us, his people. One of the primary reasons God gave marriage to people was to be a picture, a showing of what his love for us is like. I mean, all over in creation, God has given us things to know him better, to understand him better. And another example would be the reason God gives us fathers is so that we would know what it means that he is our father. And and we know that our fathers on earth don't do this perfectly, and and some don't do it at all. Just like when we look at marriages, we know that some marriages point us to Jesus and his love, and some marriages don't. But this is our calling, and this is a massive, massive calling. I mean, marriage is a huge deal to God, and it's meant to show the love that Jesus has for his people. My marriage, your future marriage, should help people see God's love more clearly. That's the bar. It's not like, am I an okay husband? Am I an okay wife? Uh, Do I stick it out even if I hate it? Do Do I work hard to be faithful? I mean, some of those are good things, but our marriages should be pictures of God's love for his people. And man, that's an impossible responsibility, right? I mean, think about the way God has loved us. What a calling that is. But one day people should look at your marriage and go, man, I understand God's love better for his people because of their marriage. Marriages are all about Jesus and his love for his people. And to close, I just want to briefly talk about how God loves his people. Because he loves us perfectly. There's nothing wrong in his love for us. There is no ill will or or wrong motives or self-fulfilling. He loves us perfectly. He loves us no matter what we do. That is unconditionally. It doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend on us doing everything right or getting to church and youth group all the right times and and praying enough times and making sure we read our Bible. He loves us no matter what we do. He loved us before we ever loved him back. He doesn't love us because we were so awesome and and we chose to follow him and, and then he chose to love us or anything like that. He loved us long before we loved him. And he loves us so much that he gave his life for us so that he could forgive us, so that nothing could get in the way of his love for us. And as we look at marriage and what it means biblically, my guess, as we just talk about this overview of marriage tonight, is that you might see a gap between what God says and and kind of what our experiences are or what our families are like or the marriages that we've seen. And there's a gap and it's like, man, This is what God's calling is, and yet this is what I've seen and experienced and lived. 
But God is gracious and he is loving and he designed marriage to work best within his plan. God doesn't call us to marriage to take something good away from us or, or to a biblical marriage to remove kind of like he's not out to get us or make life harder for us. He's saying this is how you're supposed to experience marriage. He created it. He defines it and calls us to live. If we're to get married one day to be in a marriage that is biblical and that shows people his love. And because Jesus died and rose again, God also forgives and redeems and makes new past brokenness. And that's not like a green light to do whatever we want, knowing that God's going to forgive us. But it's a reality that as we live in a world that's imperfect and we experience these imperfect things and, and we suffer the consequences of other people's choices and we may suffer the consequences of our own choices, that in the midst of all of that, God says, I'm gracious and I'm loving and I care about you and I forgive you and I can make new any mess that you've made. If we surrender ourselves to God's will, regardless of the mess you're in tonight or the mess you may be in sometime in your life, God says, I can redeem that and make that new and we can start again. No person or situation or marriage or failed marriage or broken marriage is beyond the grace and healing love of our God. His love is not defined by who follows his design. Our love for him is defined by following his design. God's love, God's love for people is not just about who follows his design. And yet our love for him, the Bible says, is defined by obeying his commands and living in a way that is holy. Minute message, But I wanted to make sure that we connect these ideas tonight and kind of wrap this up with a picture that will help us get jump started next week. So as we talk about marriage, I drew this circle on this board here to represent marriage and what God created. And so God creates marriage and everything in this circle is a part of marriage. The whole thing is the circle and yet what God creates and puts inside is part of it. And so you see, hopefully you can read that little small, it says faithfulness. That God creates marriage and a part of marriage is faithfulness. God creates marriage and within that puts companionship. That we have a, essentially a friend, a spiritual friend for life. That marriage is not just about companionship, but that's a part of it. And then God creates and puts in marriage raising children. Now, certainly this isn't the primary goal of marriage, and yet it's a part of marriage. Raising children is meant to take place within marriage, just like these things are. We continue and you have the gospel that we talked about. Marriage is a picture of the gospel that, again, that's not the entirety of marriage, but a part of marriage is this displaying God's love for his people. We have following Jesus that certainly that happens outside of marriage. And yet a part of marriage is intended that husbands and wives help each other follow Jesus. They sharpen each other. They encourage one another so that your spouse actually helps you follow Christ better. We have marriage being defined as one man and one woman, that that is inside what God has created. You have love over here, that there's love outside of marriage, and yet there is meant to be a unique love found inside marriage, the love that a husband has for his wife and that a wife has for her husband. And certainly, marriage is not just about love. So many marriages fall apart because I think it's just about love, and as soon as a feeling goes away, then they give up on the marriage. We have commitment for life, that marriage is not just a commitment. It's not meant to be like, well, I can't stand you anymore, but we're going to stay married, dang it, because it's a commitment for life, right? We may know people who are in marriages like that, and yet it, it's a part of marriage, but it's not the whole thing. It's not just a commitment, but it's not just love. It's not just about raising kids. It's not just about companionship. And yet all of these things are a part of marriage. And the reason this is so important is because God creates marriage, sets it aside as unique and holy and special, not ultimate, but a good gift. And it's within these things where all of these things are a part of marriage, but are not the entirety of marriage. And it's within all of these things that God places another part of his creation, and it is sex and our sexuality. And this is created and put within marriage Marriage is not just about sex, and yet sex is a part of marriage, just like these other things. And this is where we're going to pick up next week, but it is so important that we see that sexuality was created and designed 
inside a specific construct for a specific reason. And we're going to dive into that next week. Would you pray with me as we wrap up tonight? God, we love you. And God, I just admit that I have fallen so short of your design in so many ways in my life. And God, if your love for me was dependent on my fulfilling your commands, then God, I'd be hopeless. We would all be hopeless. But God, your love for us depends on Jesus, who came and lived a life in our place, who fulfilled all of your designs, all the commands and plans that you had, and yet still gave his life for us. And God, I just pray that you would help us tonight dwell on the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done. God, I pray your commands would not feel like a burden to us. God, that your designs would not seem uh, obtuse or ugly or, or impossible to meet. But God, that we would see them as the loving, gracious gift that you have given us. Lord, I pray for grace for those of us who just feel like we are swimming in brokenness and that we're nowhere clear, uh, close to your design. God, I pray that you would draw near, help us speak love and truth and hope and encouragement. God, we love you and we're so grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.